Hello, friends. We here today. We are diving into a comparison of three phase replacement technologies: flux-based Pool ID, SDXL-based Instant ID, and the newly released SDXL-based Ecom ID. Each has its strengths, but none of them can achieve a perfect 100% phase match just yet. To get closer to that goal, I created a workflow that claims to reach 100% phase similarity. Recently, I've made a bunch of optimizations to it, including adding a high-risk fix. I'll break down each part of the workflow step by step, so by the end, you understand how this approach can potentially get you that perfect fit match. Let's start by taking a look at the workflow I built to compare the effects of these three fit swapping technologies. There's a download link in the description below, so feel free to grab it for free and follow along. On the left side of the workflow, we have the basic settings. This is where you can set the image size, choose the checkpoint, input your prompt, and so on. Once you've configured these, they get passed to the right through nodes like bus node and anything everywhere, which then connect to the node groups for each of the three phase swapping methods. This setup keeps the workflow cleaner and easier to manage. For example, both Ecom ID and the Flux Pool ID use Pool ID's Eva clip at the same time. By routing it through the Anything Everywhere node, I can send it to both methods without needing extra wires. Similarly, the node that loads Instant ID passes through Anything Everywhere and is shared with both Ecom ID and Instant ID setups, making it super efficient. To keep things fair, I also added a Seat Everywhere node. This ensures that each phase swap method on the right side uses the exact same scene, so we are comparing them under identical conditions. This way, we get a much more accurate comparison of the results. Now let's dive into the three phase swap node groups on the right side of the workflow. First up is the Ecom ID group, which is the most complex of the three. It loads both Instant ID and Pool ID at the same time and has its own unique control net model. The other two node groups are simpler, so feel free to download the workflow if you want to explore them in more detail on your own. On the far right, there's a node group that stitches together the images generated by each method and compares them to the original reference image. I've added captions to these images using the image caption node. Just a heads up, you'll need to specify the path to a TTF font file here, otherwise this node will throw an error. I've run this workflow on a variety of faces. So let's go ahead and look at how these three phase replacement technologies compare. In the top left corner, you'll see the reference phase image we are using for comparison. Overall, I find that Instant ID tends to produce the highest face similarity. However, this varies depending on the face. Sometimes Pool ID or Ecom ID can also come very close. These face swapping techniques have a couple big advantages. First, they are much easier and faster to use compared to training a lower model. Second, if you provide photos from multiple angles, these techniques can help you generate realistic faces from different perspectives. However, the biggest drawback is that the generated face often doesn't fully capture the likeness of the original. That's what motivated me to develop my own workflow, which aims for 100% face similarity. I did get some feedback that the results weren't always natural looking, so I recently made major optimizations to improve that. Let's take a look at the updated workflow together. In the first stage, we isolate the face from the uploaded portrait and place it on a black background of a custom size. We control the face's position, size, and angle using the image blend node. Next, we use the SDXL model to fill in the black areas according to our prompts. I'm using the lighting model here, which generates an image in just four steps. The key here is the repaint type in ControlNet, which isn't available in models like Flux or SD 3.5. The basic composition generated by SDXL is in place, but there are still quite a few issues to fix. For example, we get strange halos above the head, a loss of detail in the face, seams at the neck, 
and sometimes even extra fingers. To tackle this, we have a note group on the right dedicated to restoring facial details. Other issues like the snack seam and unwanted artifacts are handled by the Flex model, which is both fast and effective. Thanks to the Turbo LoRa, it processes the image in just 8 steps. Flux takes care of most of the problems, but occasionally minor issues remain, like a section of the woman's skirt that appears distorted. These remaining issues are resolved with the second pass of repainting using Flux. While these repainting steps improve the image, they can slightly blur some facial details. To counteract this, the node group on the right restores those fine details in the face. Further down, there's another node group specifically for hand repair, which refines the hand details. Finally, we perform a two-stage upscale. This final step enhances the finer details, especially in areas like the eyelashes, skin texture, and lips, giving the image a polished, high-res finish. I'll walk you through each node group in detail to help you get the best possible results. There are a lot of specific adjustments to pay attention to, so let's go step by step. First. Close all other node groups and keep only the first one open. Once you've uploaded your image, start by filling in your prompts. Using the Exposure Adjustment node here to match the exposure of the image you want to generate. Next, use the Person Mask Ultra node to isolate the face. By default, only the Face option is enabled, which usually works well. But if you also want to include here or other parts, you can enable additional options. Now let's run the workflow to see the separated face. For the best results, it's usually a good idea to refine the mask further. Open the mask editor and start painting around the face area. You can switch the display color to make it easier to see where you are painting. Make sure to paint a generous area around the face. This is important because the edges of these masked areas can create visible seams when SDXL fills in the background. By keeping the seams away from the face, we can preserve facial details. However, avoiding including any pixels from the actual background in this mask. The goal is to keep only the face area and allow all other regions to be modified. In some cases, the background might be positioned very close to the edges of the face. When that happens, you want to avoid painting outside the face area. Check out this example to see what I mean. If you choose not to paint around the face at all, you need to be extremely precise when painting right along the face's edges. This will help prevent any visible seams. SDXL handles these tight edges quite well. So if you are careful with the mask, you should get a seamless result without any obvious lines where the face meets the background. The mask smooth node is there to soften the edges of the mask, making it easier for SDX to blend the background smoothly. When applying the mask, you want to keep the edges as smooth as possible to avoid any sharp corners. Once you've done that, go ahead and run the workflow again to check the results. The XDXL resolution node lets you set the overall canvas size. I recommend using a resolution of 768 by 1344 to generate a four-body portrait. This size works well with the upscale process. But if you need a different resolution, you can always crop the final image to fit your needs. Next, we use the image blend node to control the size, position, and angle of the face within the image. The X and the Y percentage parameters adjust the position, scale defines the size, and rotate lets you set the angle. If you are creating a full body shot, make sure to reset the face to fit naturally within the frame. Just a note, if the face ends up being too large relative to the canvas, especially if the screen is narrow, you may run into issues with the shoulders not generating correctly. Adjust the face size as needed to avoid this. The right side nodes create a mask for the face, which we use later to restore facial details. Adjust the expand and blur radius settings in the grill mask with blur nodes so the mask covers just a bit beyond the face edges. Next, we'll move on to the SDXL node group. Here, we are mainly using SDXL to handle the basic composition, so I've set it up with a lightning model. This setup prioritizes speed over image quality, which is all we need at this stage. For the control net model, I've chosen an all-in-one model. You really won't need open pose unless there are issues with how the face and the neck connect. The key setting here is the repaint type. Just leave the parameters at their default values for best results. 
go ahead and run the workflow to check the initial output. At this stage, we should have the basic composition in place. However, you might notice issues like visible seams around the neck and a few other problems. Don't worry, we'll address these issues one by one in the next steps. Now start the group of nodes on the right and run the workflow. This group is designed to extend the original mask, which includes the neck area. SDX often creates a visible seam below the neck when it fills in the black area. So we need to expand the mask slightly to give us more control over this area. Adjust the expand and the blur radius parameters carefully. The goal is to extend the mask enough to exclude the seam without affecting the face itself. This will prepare the area for the flux model to handle the seam cleanup. The nodes on the right are also responsible for restoring facial details. Here we generate two slightly different versions of the face. Then we use the blend percentage parameter in the image blend node group to decide which version to link towards for the final image. Once we are satisfied with the facial details, we will use the flux model to address any remaining issues in the image. I'm using the flux-based pixel wave model here, which produces excellent high-quality artwork. If you are tight on video memory, the FP8 version at 11 GB works well. But if you have more memory available, you can opt for FP16 for even finer results. There's also a Turbo LoRa connected to this setup, which allows it to complete in just 8 steps. The input model conditioning node is linked to the mask we extended earlier. Go ahead and run the workflow to see the results. At this stage, you may still notice a few remaining issues. So we will activate the next group of nodes on the right for an additional repainting pass. This second repainting helps fix lingering artifacts, and it also adjusts the hand if there were any problems with it. However, both rounds of repainting tend to blur some facial details. You might not notice it right away, but the loss of detail becomes more obvious when you upscale the image. To address this, we will activate another node group on the right to restore those fine details in the face. You can compare the results to the previous version from the restore detail group and see the improvement in clarity. Let's move on to the next group and continue refining the image. This next group focuses on enhancing the hand details. After two rounds of repainting with the flux model, most of the hand issues should already be resolved. However, we can add even more fine detail to make the hands look realistic. Let's run the workflow. If you zoom in, you'll notice the hand has much sharper details. Even veins are visible. Finally, let's move on to the upscale step. I chose the 4x upscale model specifically for the face, and then scaled it down by a factor of 2, effectively giving us a double upscale. If you have enough video memory, you can adjust this factor for an even higher resolution. I also included the LoRa to bring out more skin texture and detail. One important note. Make sure the scheduler in the sampler is set to exponential. This helps maintain consistency in the facial features, preventing them from shifting during the upscale process. Run the workflow. and you are seeing enhanced details across the face, hands, and even the dress. Now let's compare the final result with the original reference image. The facial features should remain consistent with sharp detail and texture. If you feel the details should use the final touch-up, you can always blend the image again in Photoshop for actual refinement. I'd love to hear any suggestions you have for this paid workflow, and I'll keep optimizing and exploring new techniques to improve it further. Thanks for following along.